I might actually have entered the 21st century. Well, congratulations. <laughs> okay, now my yeah. assistant is finding the volume. There we okay. go. All right. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Hey, Brian. Hi, Steve. How you doing? I'm very well. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. Um, thanks for agreeing to do this with me. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, and you got your book, right? Yes, of course. Well, cool. Well, uh, yeah, I want to thank you. I've been like talking to people uh, for this little YouTube channel thing. I've kind of started to uh, try to drum up attention to my my book. So mm -hmm. people uh, that are in the book, people that aren't in the book, and um, I'm glad to get you on here. So thank you very much for that. My you know, pleasure. I'm just gonna ask you a bunch of stupid questions, most of which will have to do with uh, your drumming over the years. And, okay. Uh, that kind of thing. Well, first off, how are you doing? How, how uh, we're are, doing great. How's this year been for you? This year? <laughs> it has been uh, a little surreal. Um, I've been able to keep working. Um, somehow landscaping is essential. That actually kind of makes sense, but uh, for health yeah. reasons and sanitation reasons, it's essential. Um, and um, Marcus and I have been practicing ever since about the second week of the lockdowns. Uh, Monica and I went to a, a Home Depot or a Lowe's and the parking lot was completely full. I realized there were probably about 250, 300 people there. Hardly anybody had masks on. And I thought, you know, the practice space is gonna be completely abandoned. Let's, let's just practice. And it has been. Uh, we're hearing more people down there now, but it's not like we're really running into many people in the hallways or anything. And everybody's out of the building pretty much by about 10 o'clock, except for us, maybe even earlier than that. So it's been really nice. And when there are bands practicing, you, that, that, that's when you remember how difficult it can be to write music when other people are playing completely different stuff around you. <laughs> but sure. for the most part, yeah, the, the traffic and everything has been really nice. But you, know, you worry about your family, you worry about friends, you worry about how other people are dealing with this. And you know, that, we have a family member who's now full-fledged germaphobe and is having a very, very difficult time with all this at the age of 70. So it's just, you know, everybody has something to worry about. And so I'm no different in that regard. Yeah, same here. So, but yeah, we're, we're, we're doing pretty good too. And I'm not doing landscaping, obviously, but people still seem to need artwork. So, yeah. So I'm still in business. Good. Hopefully art will always be recession proof. Yeah, it's, pro it's proven to be that way, you know, uh, more so for people that draw and unfortunately less Less so for people who are professional musicians who <laughs> play their roles with with uh, playing music, uh, right. which is something that you've never done. You've always had your landscape escaping job, which means you're probably the smartest guy in the room right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am the only guy in the room right now, so I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> so you brought up Marcus. Um, I guess we should let people know that Marcus is... Uh, the guitar player for Confessor that is um, the person that you've been writing a lot of uh, music with. Yeah, Marcus. Years. Yeah, uh, Marcus, I guess he's probably been with us now for, I'll bet it's been six or seven years already. Um, he's the youngest member of the band. Um, he was born after my first show with the band, which <laughs> I think I mentioned when you were over doing the interview. I just, I get tickled by that every time. Um, but it's nice to have a young person uh, who has that type of energy and, and is willing to stay in the practice space late and, and go down there whenever and do things. Um, that's the way I work best. When you know, when you're, you're a creative person as well. When you get in that zone, in that mode, you, you stay with it. You know, yeah, as you long as you can. Yeah, and, and Marcus right. is wired that way. And he also comes, he has a more metal guitar background than anybody else who's been a guitarist and confessor. So uh, this comes kind of naturally to him and he's a really great mimic. And he's, um, if, if I want to toss something out to him that he's never tried before, he can usually do pretty well with uh, trying to emulate what I'm describing and not playing guitar myself. I just, I have, I do the Beavis and Butthead thing where you know, my riffs go chugga, 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 chugga until it's actually written on guitar. <laughs> well, you said he's like the most metal person. Well, Confessor's pretty metal. So when you say he's the most metal, is that just uh, he knows more about the kind of metal that's been around for the last 20 years or 30 years, the kind of metal that I probably 
I personally wouldn't know anything about. The other guys who have been in Confessor, um, a, a lot of them started off listening to more rock stuff when they were younger, and, and they come from more of a rock, a rock school of guitar, whereas Marcus, sure. I think he was immersed, and he's young enough that, that uh, Metallica were not underground when he was a kid, like they were when we were kids. So right. all that stuff was out there, all that thrash stuff was out there, it was easier for him to access, and that's what he gravitated towards. So his, his musicianship background is firmly based in, in a metal aesthetic, whereas other guys were coming from rock, and a lot of times the rock thing would come through, and that, that's part of what made Confessor sound different. Um, but with this album in particular, we're trying to get a little bit more, you know, the phrase is probably overused, but back to our roots. Um, and it takes a guy who's, who's comes from a more aggressive school of metal guitar to make that work as easily as it has. And it's been really nice. Right. So that, so uh, when you said that, that means you're working on releasing an album next year or something like that? Yeah, we were, we were hoping to have it out this year, but you know, that little pandemic thing happened. Um, yeah. So what we've done so far is we've recorded four songs to allow Scott, our singer who lived in China for 10 years and has just recently moved back to the States. So he's getting uh, reacclimated to singing. He, he had no outlet for that the whole time he was in China. And I wouldn't say that he gave up on singing. He just, it, was, it wasn't realistic that he had any way to pursue it. So he's back, uh, he's accustomed to being in the States again, and he's accustomed to being creative. And he is currently, when they can, he's going into the studio and, and actually working out those four songs. And he's, he's down to the last one right now. And so what we'll do with that is just hear that stuff, you know, remember what it's like to record together, to work together, to write together, and then um, at this point, we will use that as a way to do some homework with those four songs, and then we'll start putting the actually assembling the album. And yeah, I guess at this point, it's it would be more realistic to say it's coming out next year. Right, right. Uh, well, I want to ask you a few questions. I, I know that uh, I covered a lot of this uh, in the book, but I'm going to still just ask you now because I have you here. So uh, I, I want to ask you. Um, you started out playing drums and learned very quickly and you were kind of introduced to um, the idea of being in the band through the, I could, I could have this wrong, but it was because of uh, your friendship with the mysterious Phil Swisher. Yes. Uh, I mean, he was kind of like your introduction into, I guess for lack of better words, the local punk rock scene here in Raleigh. Um, oh, absolutely. Right. Um, what you, uh, that was like 84, 85 or something like that? Um, I met Phil in 11th grade, so yeah, 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 that would have been 80, I think it was 84, uh, maybe even 83, but yes, um, so COC, they, you know, they were the heavyweights around here, and at that point, Eric Ike was singing, and they were still, they were, they were definitely a punk rock band, they hadn't started uh, making any sort of crossover thing yet, and um, yeah, Phil had befriended those guys, and my first punk rock experience was the, uh, the infamous Battle of the Bands at Dorton Arena, where um, yeah, a Malay broke out about 30 seconds into their, their set. I bet it wasn't even that long. And um, uh, yeah, the promoter got slapped by the mother of one of COC's members. And uh, it's Woody's, Woody's, Woody's mom, Karen. Uh, yes, yes, that, that's the way I always heard it. Um, so uh, a couple weeks after that, there was another show that CUC played um, in that church in Durham, uh, St. Joseph's Cultural Center, I believe is what they called it. And yeah. um, so it was down in the dirty basement. It was a total punk rock scene. And I had a blast. Uh, the, the energetic release that punk allowed was, was really spoke to me at that point. And, and at that point, I was still very, very, very fresh behind a drum kit. Um, I was, yeah. Yeah, I'm still learning now, but I was definitely learning at that point. Um, and uh, yeah, just the, the energy, it was new to me. I'd lived in my, my shell up until that point for the most part. And that was being introduced to punk rock and, and, and suddenly being forced to play music in front of other people forced me to be more of an extrovert than I ever had been. And so there were a lot of things going on at once, but it, it was a really fun time. And uh, yeah, I have Phil Swisher to thank for that and COC in the local scene. I mean, it was, it was very, it was a, a communal family at that point. Definitely. Uh, and that led you to be briefly in this band uh, called Bloodbath that um, I had a videotape of one time and there you were back there. And it was like, kind of like COC Junior back then, kind of. That, yeah, that, that's fair enough. 
That's fair to say. Sure, absolutely. Uh, word math, you played a handful of shows, and then I guess that was over. And then you said that you just kind of practiced drums for like a couple of years before you even thought about uh, looking in a bit, looking to join another band. You were just, um, I guess, maybe wood wood shedding or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's probably that's probably the fairest way to describe it. I mean, honestly, I'm, it's probably true that the only reason I played in Bloodbath is because Phil, who was my best friend at the time, sort of, I, I wouldn't say he pressured me, but he, he aggressively encouraged me to do so. Um, otherwise, I probably wouldn't have had the cojones to, to walk up to somebody and say, hey man, let's start playing music. That's just, that's not who I am. So it was convenient for sure. Um, and I knew people who could make it happen. And then I, I don't remember why we, oh, actually I do remember why we stopped playing shows. Uh, Phil and I wanted to take things in a slightly more metal direction and the other two guys were were definitely in the hardcore school and wanted to stay there. So we only played a handful of shows. And then um, that was probably about the, about the time I moved out of the house. So I didn't really even have a place to play drums for, for most of uh, that time. I, I was able to have them set up in my apartment for a little bit. Um, that house on Boylan that was this quote unquote COC house. I lived there for just a few months before we all got kicked out. Um, yeah, yeah, the blue one. It's still that same shade of blue too. It's amazing yeah. 30 years later or actually longer than that. But yeah, I um, in that time I was learning how to play drums and, and, and practicing the stupid things that I practice. And at that point I started seeing Confessor in, um, in, um, at the Fallout Shelter, which is a pretty small club at the time. And yeah. I really enjoyed seeing them. And I had always wanted to meet their guitarist. He was a guy I knew who he was in high school, but we didn't know each other. But he right. seemed very approachable and accessible and very nice. And eventually we met and we we hit it off right away. And it took me probably a year or more to get him to finally bring his amp and his cabinet over to, to where I lived so that we could play music together. But I was trying to get in the band for a while, but I was, you know, I didn't want to be too aggressive and and, and scare anybody off. So... I bided my time and eventually it happened. All right. And um, you famously said in my book, my now world famous book, that uh, even though you were, you enjoyed the punk rock, hardcore music scene in the world for a, a while, you said that really wasn't where your heart lied and uh, that the only couple of bands that you could, well, you could think of that you have fond memories of, even if you don't really listen to them or thought were good, uh, were uh, Discharge and the Crucifix Dehumanization record, which is, I think, a very interesting choice and in, 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 uh, might have anything else out there. But you said that you just felt playing more um, heavy metal stuff, the musicianship just appealed to you more and it seemed more, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, I don't want to say serious, but uh, what was it that you found more attractive uh, and like maybe, I don't want to say the metal world, but that sort of music as opposed to uh, to uh, punk rock. What were the pitfalls of punk rock? <laughs> <laughs> and what, why, because you were already like into like things like Rush and obviously you were influenced by people like Neil Peart and I imagine other right. rock. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Why, why was it like sort of like this passing thing, you know? Uh, um, and why, why'd you feel more at home playing for a lack of, uh, better word, uh, heavy metal. Because both of them also, both of those worlds have a lot in common. They both had the same sort of like underground sort of tape trading world and scene. Mm -hmm. So they both have a lot in common, no matter what anyone says. But, you know, um, obviously you, one of them spoke to you more. And uh, I'm going to shut up now and let you answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so so the, the appeal to punk rock was the energy. It, it, 100% the energy. The biggest pitfall with punk rock was the jangly, whiny nature of guitar and vocals. And so you, you mentioned Discharge and, and Crucifix. You mean, They're absolutely. You mean. That? Yeah, yeah, that, I may have heard that a time or two, but, and it's much like the, I was never a Sex Pistols fan, and they were just the, the, the vocals were just so obnoxious to me. And the, and the people who like, like the Andy Kaufman's of the world where their entire shtick is just to irritate you. 
I find that irritating. So they're being successful, but I don't want to feel that way. Um, <laughs> but the, the discharge and the crucifix, uh, I, I'm, no doubt there are things that I missed, but they were really, certainly the discharge, that was the darker, heavier, more powerful punk rock album that I Absolutely. ran into. Yeah, and so what I realized was, with the underground metal at the time was that that power and that 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 darkness was much more prevalent in in metal at the time and before i started playing drums i thought i was going to end up being an illustrator and the stuff that i drew was really really detail oriented i mean i would spend not weeks but months on an illustration you know sketch it out with pencil and then do it in ink later on so yeah. you know I, back then my eyes were good enough. I didn't need a magnifying glass to do what I did, but I would just, you know, probably kill my neck and shoulders and my posture later for adulthood by leaning over and just, you know, really fretting over every little detail. And so what metal did is metal had more room for detailed drums than punk rock. Punk rock was all faster than mid tempo. It wasn't like fast, like not every band was DRI, but because of its speed, it kind of, it, 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 it sort of forced you to play a little bit faster. And when you're playing faster, there's not, you have some freedom, but there's not a lot of stuff that you could do. But the metal stuff that I liked was, it wasn't the fast stuff. I, I did like Slayer, but I, did, I wasn't one of those people who felt like metal was better because it got faster. I actually found that to be, you know, the the, the, yeah, absolutely the opposite. Yeah, I like time for the notes to breathe and the, and the mood to creep in. So bands like Trouble, um, some more mid-tempo bands like Nasty Savage, King Diamond, Destruction. I like all that stuff. And yes, all those bands can be fast, but that's not what they focus on. So okay. it was the aggressive nature of the music. I found it to be darker. I found it to be meaner. And to me, and the way that I was approaching drums at the time, it really, it just opened up an entire universe for me to play around with. Whereas punk rock, everything about punk rock was punk rock. And if you like those one or two things about it, then you know you're in hog heaven but if you wanted more then you'd have to seek things out elsewhere and that's just that's just the way the music was presented to me in a certain order that led me down a certain path and i i really i, I really glommed on to it right right and, and then uh when you finally got graham fry to uh bring over his amp and you started playing together that was basically the the nucleus uh the songwriting team that pretty much wrote when you join Confessor, the next three, those three legendary uh, demos. Yeah, uh, yeah. That came out one or, or maybe three of them came out in two years, whatever. But um, that was really exciting because um, when I talk to people about Confessor, you know, inevitably it'll come up for sure. And Confessor is like the favorite band of one person. In right. Every, in every city of this fucking world, you know? <laughs> you know, and you're like, a, a very well-respected drummer or two people, you know, it, it's just like the people that like it, it may not be a lot of people over a 30 year pe period, but the people that like it really like it. And like, I feel like I'm not blowing smoke up your ass when I say that you in particular with your drumming style and how you wrote with Graham, you pioneered or helped pioneer this style of um, heavy, heavy music that has been sort of you know, kind of, I don't want to say ripped off or, you know, it's, it's, it's inspired people for sure. Sure. Um, but I still have not yet heard a band that really sounds anything like Confessor based on the work you guys did for those demos. Was it exciting uh, to be coming up with such bizarre and complex <laughs> off-putting music in heavy metal? And also, what also put you guys over the edge was just having Scott Jeffries because his voice is completely at odds with um the style of music right uh, he's singing melodies that run counter to every anything you guys are doing and that gave it like you know instead of somebody going, blah, 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 that actually gave it way of a, um, a bigger kind of strength to it you know it made it very unique so the music is already interesting enough and the drumming is very complex and then you have this like <laughs> you know, wailing banshee vocals that is, it's like almost like art rock, but it's really heavy music. Did you have any sense of knowing uh, what you guys were creating or was it just a happy accident? It doesn't sound like something that was planned. It just seems like- Right. 
No, no, it definitely was not planned. We were just doing what we enjoyed doing. And uh, yeah, the original part of this question was, uh, was it exciting? And absolutely, it was exciting. It was fantastic. I lived for it. We practiced maybe three nights a week. Couldn't wait for the next time that we would get together and practice. And it was, you know, to, to tap into this creative well that you might not even have known you had and for it to be so satisfying and fulfilling. And, and, and at that point we were young and everybody was excited about it together and we were all on the same page and it was phenomenal. Um, yeah. So yes, absolutely. Uh, we didn't think that we were, you know, we didn't set out to do anything in particular other than to stay heavy and to not, not bore ourselves with our music. And I bore really easily, really quickly with music. Um, playing, especially back then playing drums. Like I, I can appreciate a more laid back approach now, but at the time I just wanted to push myself as far as I could. And Graham was right there with me. And, you know, Brian wrote plenty of riffs as well, but it was Graham and I who were the ones who were writing most everything together. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, as with regard to Scott, yeah, we, we ultimately cultivated a very, very, very narrow fan base. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but even having said that about his vocals, because Scott's vocals were very polarizing, even if people didn't like with Scott, um, people still seem to expect it, even if they weren't necessarily a fan of it. Like nobody can really say, well, this just sucks. You know, I mean, they cannot like it because of this reason or another, but it always seemed like even when people weren't totally behind that narrow, yeah, thing, right. people seemed to respect uh what you're doing and that that probably when i say that i probably mean other musicians and stuff like that Is oh that yeah we we definitely fell into that group of uh, a musicians band um and when we would play here at, uh, locally uh there would people would come who i had had conversations with i know that they didn't like our music but they loved seeing us live so yeah, yeah there was a lot of that going on and and, and you know you're right i it, I'm not blowing smoke up my own butt either, but I mean, I, I honestly have never heard another band come very close to sounding like what we were doing and, and what we still do. So, you know, that, that could be good, that could be bad. I, I take it as, I wear it as a badge of honor, not because I think that we're better or than anyone else, but, you know, it just proves after 30 years that what we were doing then that felt unique really must have been. Yeah, yeah totally, totally. Uh, and that... And, and doing all that stuff led you to um, that out of town gig at the Texas pool that I got to ask you about because <laughs> for no other reason than I just, I'll be able to like put some pictures of uh, from that gig into uh, this interview because that's one of my favorite stories. And it's a legendary YouTube video of you playing at this, this weird pool overhanging this giant, just, it's a very strange scene and the weirdest thing about it is that the sound quality is really excellent which is um which is also pretty funny so what what why were you playing a pool in texas and <laughs> so i think that that was in 88 and we were contacted by a guy um i guess he, he must have been from houston and he was he was telling us about this show this uh heavily promoted show that a radio station put on that they had already done a time or two and it was you know there's supposed to be thousands and thousands of people there so we said yeah sure let what we would love to do that like i said we were young so we drove out to texas we got to this place and it was a big wave pool i had never been to a wave pool before and uh as it turns out there were not thousands of people there there were possibly dozens of people there possibly um, so yeah, the awesome. video is funny because yeah, <laughs> when the camera pans out into the uh, audience, they're all floating in a wave pool and they they appear to be dads who are a little confused by what's going on and <laughs> kids who aren't really paying that much attention. Um, but it, it's funny. I, um, there are, I, I've talked to other friends of mine who said that they had had, um, two conversations in a week about that show and the people didn't know who confessor were but they knew the band that played at the water park <laughs> because of that video. It's really good. It's so weird. You gotta see it. Um, yeah, well, thanks for indulging me with that story. Oh, you sure. Got, you got massively sunburned too, right? Oh, I was sunburned before the set was over. I had little, I had, I've never been sunburned this way. So I'm a redhead you know, we're not supposed to be out in the sun. I'm a day walker technically. <laughs> and usually I don't get blisters, but my forehead was covered in little BB sized blisters after that show. Cause we were on top of, 
the wave pool, like part of the video, if you look behind us, there's a transformer on a pole. So we had to have been like 50 feet up, 60 feet up. <laughs> and the sunlight was just reflecting off the, the, whatever the material was on the roof. And yeah, I was, I was toasted by the end of that. It, it was pretty bad. <laughs> uh, um, so what, um, I'm going to talk about the condemned album and the period leading up to it. I'm going to try to speed this along a little bit because I, uh, I don't want to take up more than an hour of your time if, if uh, that's okay. Sure. Uh, so Graham quit, and um, I've been joined. He was, uh, I guess, a roadie that replaced replaced Graham, and Graham just just wasn't into uh, playing that style of music anymore. And all this stuff happened right when you were going to do a record for Eric Records. Um, Correct. Why did Graham, why did Graham lose interest? Why'd you pick Ivan? And how did the Eric Records deal come about? Um, <clears throat> so Graham started listening to different kinds of music and playing with a, a second band. And he started getting into older 70s prog stuff and Mahavishnu Orchestra, lots of John McLaughlin stuff. And I knew Graham well enough that, um, that once his interest was focused on something else. I knew that it was just a matter of time. And it took about a year or so of, yeah. of his waning interest. And you could see it at practice and, and it was beginning to affect things, but that was the first time anybody had, had quit once I joined the band anyway. Um, so yeah, he just, he lost his, his love for metal and wanted to pursue what he was interested in. So he did. Um, Ivan was the other guitarist, Brian. He was Brian's best friend. Uh, we all knew Ivan because we all went to high school together. And he had always played guitar. He had been in uh, another local band, but they weren't the type of band that was trying to do anything. So we knew that he could play. He was always around. Everybody got along with him. So uh, I don't know who it was. I'm assuming it must have been Brian who asked him if he wanted to start playing with Confessor. And he was concerned that he might not be good enough. And he's like, man, I just want to make sure that Confessor's badass. I'm like, well, you know, whatever, whatever that means, but we would like for you to do it if you want to do it. So um, he, he joined and within six months we were recording the record and within probably, I guess, I, I don't know, within the year we were doing the Gods of Grind tour and the Nocturnus tour in Europe. So Ivan came in, um, he only had to learn things for about six months. Then he got all the fun stuff. He got the, the record, he got the touring. And then I guess two years after that, no, it was, probably, it was less than that. Maybe about a year after that, he quit to go to school. But uh, yeah, Graham, yeah, he quit right before everything was getting ready to happen. So, I mean, I, I have to give it to him. You know, he didn't, he didn't stick around just for that, which probably would have made him miserable. And, and then everybody else would have begun to feel that as well. So yeah, it's just the way the timing worked out. It was just weird, but um, yeah, that, that's the way life is sometimes. Um, so that you the record comes out, it's a very interesting record and it seems like it's kind of stands out from all the other Eric records. Oh yeah, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Was it received well? Uh, at the that, time. I don't remember. Yeah, well, uh, Eric were all about us for a little bit and that's how we ended up on the Gods of Grind thing. So, um, but it was received, you know, it, it got the same sorts of reviews that we got live. There were people who got it there were people who didn't quite get it, but were really intrigued. And then there were people who despised it. So we've, we've always had to deal with those things. And, you know, any, anything, any creative venture that's, that stands out for any reason is going to have people that it turns on and people that it turns off. Yeah. So, yeah, we always accepted that. And I, I also took that as a badge of honor. Just that just proved that we were doing something a little bit different at the time. Uh, but as far as its overall reception, I think it took a while for a lot of people to to really be able to get into it. You know, some people would have liked it right away, but, you know, we did stand out and, and the vocals were really weird and the, the the riffs were weird and the drumming was weird. So for the type of person who wanted to just be able to headbang to something right away, they probably weren't going to like Confessor. Um, but if they're the kind of person who just likes to headbang, even to pop stuff when it's on the radio, then they would have given it a chance because music is music and they like music. And then, you know, there are other people who are all about it. But um, we we were one of the first bands to to have all boogie stuff. And that That's was a certain, yeah, that was a guitar sound that was really thick and, and heavy at the time. So even if uh, people might not have been so into us, 
And they probably thought we sounded pretty good live, especially in a small club. Those, those boogies really do great in small clubs. Right, right. Um, and then it just seemed like after a little while, you guys just sort of, uh, I don't know if disbanding was the word, but you, you, some of you just morphed into another band, which is Fly Machine, a few years later. Um, and I remember, like, I was in a band that played with Fly Machine, and I, and I thought Fly Machine was a really good band. It was like, sort of like, I don't want to say a simpler confessor, because it, it didn't really sound like confessor, but it just sounded kind of like more rock, I guess, but still with, you know, like, your drums were still in there. There's still little things going on here and there. Um, but it seemed like people didn't really seem to, to pick up on it or... or, or or yeah. That, what was going on around the time of uh, Fly Machine? Why did Fly Machine even exist? Well, okay, so I had mentioned before that, that Ivan quit to go to school not long after we had done the tours. Okay, so I had mentioned before that, that Ivan quit to go to school not long after we had done the tours. And it took us a little while, six months or so, to find a guitarist who's still with the band. His name's Chris Nolan. So he's been with us ever since 93. Um, okay. And when, when we were ready to play our first show with Chris, we broke the set up with three different guitarists. Ivan played the intro set. Uh, Chris played a second set with us. These were like, you know, maybe four songs a piece or so. And then Graham played the final maybe six songs or something. And uh, that was early in 94. And that was uh, Scott, our singer, that night announced that he was going to be leaving the band. So we knew that was coming. We didn't know he was going to make the announcement at the show, but we knew it was coming. And it took us a couple of years to find a singer who could uh, who who would end up working out. We had a couple of guys who were in the band just long enough to begin to think about playing shows, and then you know something would happen. That one guy said we were just too heavy; and it was it didn't suit his vocal approach. Another guy kind of flaked. Uh, he sounded great, but he wasn't very reliable. So we 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 had some issues trying to find a replacement, and it took a couple of years. And in those two years, the difference between what metal was in 94 and what metal was in 96 is a pretty big difference because the the new metal was starting to come out people were starting to make money with this kind of thing and it was no longer the small community of like-minded people that it once was and fly machine um we we changed the name we we did all this thinking that we were going to continue with confessor but once we found another singer who was also a guitarist, we realized that we were writing slightly different stuff. The vocals were very different and it wouldn't have been fair to us nor our fans to call that confessor. And we didn't want to be held, um, we, we didn't want to be held up to any standard because right. if we weren't gonna be writing that kind of stuff, it wasn't gonna be fair to compare us to, to what we've done. I mean, it'd be natural, but it just it wouldn't have been right. And we also, at that point, we had kind of a chip on our shoulders about how we couldn't get any label interest whatsoever. So we we're like, you know what? To hell with this. We're going to go by a different name. We're not going to be held prisoner by our past. And uh, so that was how Fly Machine came to be. And when we played around maybe six or seven years or so, um, basically the small, the same local circuit that, that Confessor were able to play. And uh, yeah, just never really gained much traction. Uh, you mentioned it being more rock. Um, once Graham left the band, uh, he was the, the main guitar writing force. So with yeah. his personality and his inspirations out, different inspirations came to the forefront. And that's what, you know, that's why the rock thing became more, you could hear it more, it was more discernible because the other personality writing guitar was totally came from rock. And right. there, yeah, there was a weird balance trying to keep things heavy, trying to keep things interesting from my perspective because rock doesn't really offer me, but so much. I, I, I like some of it, but I just don't, you know, I don't get crazy about rock bands. And um, so there was some juggling. There's always juggling. You know, you got sure. egos and personalities and inspirations. And so everything changes when you bring in different members or when different members take different roles, like writing roles or something. So uh, yeah, the sound changed. It was an honest, you know, it was just what that particular group of people was going to be doing. And yeah, like I said, we stuck with that for about six or seven years until there were suddenly invitations for Confessor to reform and do a couple things. And that's how Confessor came around again. Yeah. And uh, we talked about, uh, in the interview, we talked about the second record, which um, I think is like a really good vocal driven sort of record. It's definitely mm -hmm. a different, maybe simpler, um, but it does have 
sort of a gloomy sort of feel to it, but it's really vocal driven. And you said the result of that record was mainly because of the um, Brian and whoever the, uh, I don't know what the other guy's name was. That was in the band. Yeah, was gonna, but, uh, you got Sean McCoy at the time, yeah. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on uh, that period, that record? Because you went, you traveled, you finally were able to go to Europe or some other places like that eventually with, with the band. Uh, how was that? Yeah. Um, well, so at first, when um, when Sean joined the band, uh, Chris Nolan, who had joined at the tail end of Confessor, he he stuck with it for a while, and then um, he went to school um, to uh, God. How old must he have been? I, I don't know. Sometime in the late twenties or so, he went to school. Um, time just time just blends together after thirty years, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it, really does. it really does. It really does. However long ago you think something was, you need to add about fifty. That's how it is. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so Chris moved on to do other things. Um, and we got this guy named Sean, who was also a local guy, to join the band. And, and at first, we were, you know, there was that excitement because you got new people, everything's revitalized. And we wrote, uh, I guess, two or three songs together as a band that came out pretty well, but not everybody in the band, certainly musically, saw things the same way. So eventually, what ended up happening is Sean and I would write a song and then and Brian and I would write a song mm -hmm. but the two of them were never able to find a way to make their styles really jive with each other so the Brian songs really stood out from the Sean songs and me trying to keep things confessor I was trying to find ways to blend the two but it just wasn't going to happen so there were it, it was it was interesting because the rock thing for a drummer like myself, there's not so much I can do with rock stuff. And I was willing, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between, there's, there's music that I enjoy listening to, but I wouldn't necessarily want to play all that music as a drummer who's trying to push himself as much as, as I try. Um, so that I had, I struggled with, um, with our musical direction at times and even the stuff that was busier, it wasn't really busy in the same way because it was being written by somebody else. So yeah. there, there was lots of me trying to find my place in the band. I didn't always feel like, like I was even needed in the band if we were gonna go in a certain direction. Um, yeah. But we made it through that and years and years later, I, I, I don't typically listen to the music that I record, but every now and then it's like, yeah, let me put this on, see what I feel about this five years later. And eventually I got to where I could, I could hear that there's some really good ideas on that record. Um, but for, for me, most of the time when I would try to listen to it for the first few years, uh, what came back to me was the difficulty I had in finding my role and finding things to do. So right. I shall, I, I, I just, I didn't, I, I didn't even really consider that record <laughs> as something I had done. Uh, but now I feel differently about it now. And, and, and I don't mind it, um, but I did always think, like you said, you said that was a vocal driven record. I did yes. always feel like Scott was the thing that made that record work. I guess Loincloth was next. And Loincloth is really interesting um, because it seemed like uh, the world could have been Loincloth's oyster, but you guys lived in two different cities and um, uh, um, you, you made that first recording with Penn Played guitar. Mm -hmm. Yep. I guess Penn Tannen asked you to drum in a band called Loincloth, and you did it. And then I remember that came out, and people were just like, "Whoa!" And and then eight years passed by. <laughs> like, <laughs> I guess getting to practice was kind of hard, perhaps. Or, or, or oh, you know? yeah. There are lots of obstacles in the way of that band. Um, but I, I will tell you, and yeah, you're, you're not exaggerating about the eight years. It may have been more like 10. Um, it, but so we, so yeah, okay. I found out at, um, I went to go see the champs at Kings and yes. there were maybe three people. I think it was three people that night tapped me on the shoulder and said, man, I heard you playing with Penn Rollins in the band. And I thought, wow, that's, you're the third person who's asked me that tonight. I mean, I know Penn. But I haven't spoken to him in a couple of years, so I, I decided to call him. Yeah, yeah. So I decided to call him and see see what that was about. And what that was about is that he and Tannen had gotten together and decided that that they should somehow lure me into a band with them. 
So they told people that we were playing together, hoping that it would eventually get to me and that <laughs> what happened. Yeah. Brilliant. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but um, yeah, that came at a time, let's see, uh, our first practice was 2000. So yeah, Confessor were probably, we were writing uh, Unraveled and Loincloth was something that I really needed at the time because it gave me the, the, uh, the metal outlet. It gave me a chance to really try to push myself again. And um, we just, you know, God, there would be six months where we wouldn't even get together because they didn't have reliable mode of transportation. They didn't really have, you know, they weren't uh, well off enough to be able to just, you know, take a train or a bus down every weekend or whatever. So we would literally go six months. I think it's happened two, maybe three different times where we would not see each other or talk to each other really in those six months. But somehow we were able to keep the band alive and we were able to keep it alive because we were so so into what we were doing it was so much fun practicing with those guys and the stuff that we would come up with was just a blast to play it felt like this is home musically that felt like home yeah there's definitely not the word res, the word restraint would not be the word i would use for that first uh, seven inch and uh, New. <laughs> probably not probably not for the uh, subsequent album years later with uh the uh, trio version of the band and uh, yeah. you guys also did another record after that and but you guys broke up before the record came out yeah um, so you did like so essentially in 10 years at least I'm, I'm thinking you did a seven inch you did two like an album and maybe mm -hmm. an almost album and played a small handful of shows and you stretched it out to 10 years is that right uh, the, the stretch was actually considerably longer than that. So yeah, the first practice was 2000. Uh, we probably had that demo out within a year and a half, maybe two years, but the, um, Iron Balls of Steel didn't come out until 2012. And then the, the second record came out in 2017. So we're talking is it really about, eight, is it really eight years ago? When the Iron Balls I know, was... I know. Oh, good. Yeah. Point. I'm not sure how that happened, but um, yeah. And that's just a testament to how much we loved writing together and how much we loved the music that we were playing. Wow. That's amazing. Um, well, let me ask you a few more questions and I'll, I'll let you go. Um, so you already told me about what Confessor is doing now. You're working on four songs and Scott's getting used to being back and living in North Carolina after being right. in Japan for, for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, what kind of stuff do you actually sit around and listen to? It's, I don't listen to as much now. And that's basically because I spend more time listening to what we're working on now because I'm really trying to get all this wrapped up. And that's really been the case for a couple of years. But the music that I spend most of my time listening to isn't metal. Um, I, oh, yeah. I listen uh, so we both know Thomas Phillips, who played bass and with Loincloth. He joined so that we would be able to do some shows, and then he recorded with the second record with us. Um, he has done minimalist, uh, glitch, microsound, trip hop, whatever you want to call it. I think the name changes every month and a half for that style of music, but it's it's like it's almost like soundtrack noise, like minimalist soundtrack noise. So I listen to stuff like that. Um, I'll listen to some classical. I have a greater appreciation for classical, for classic rock than I ever did, even when I was in high school and that's all anybody listened to. Um, you, mean, uh, you mean classic rock, like the Def Jam Trouble Records, that kind of classic rock? <laughs> no, actually there was music before then that's, that, that's better rock. Um, but yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. I, I, made, um, like I made this Led Zeppelin recording and it's like, to me, I always like the big, epic, darker songs. So sure. I've had people over who are also fans and, and played my Led Zeppelin thing. And they're like, oh man, what happened to that other song? And my response is, well, that song sucks and I don't listen to music that sucks. So that's why it's not on my recording. Um, <laughs> but so, and, and I've, in the last few years, I've gotten into this, this uh, mid sixties to late sixties pop kind of thing that I realized I, it's, it's a throwback. It's a nostalgia trip, but it also, in digging into that stuff, I like it because it's sincere. It sounds like people who actually enjoy playing music, they're not necessarily trying to make a point. Um, and it, it's, it's pre-politics, it's pre the hypersexualization of music. It's just people who don't look like musicians 
playing music and, and doing a really fantastic job of it. And it's like melody lines that get stuck in your head. Um, but I do listen to heavy stuff every now and then. And like, I've, I've been a huge fan of Godflesh for years and years and years, uh, which anybody who knows Godflesh and knows Confessor would wonder how that happens. But I just, they're so heavy. They're so bleak. I just, I love it. Um, yeah. And then there's some, there's a, a band called Decapitated who have one of the most phenomenal drummers I've ever heard. Unfortunately, he died several years ago in an accident. Um, but uh, there was that ne band Necrophagist who had a couple of records that really flipped people out and kind of began this new era of super, super technical metal with insane drumming. And uh, like both them and Decapitated are technically Blast bands. Blast doesn't do anything for me, but the way they utilize it it's more palatable. It's not blast all the time. They're doing all this nuts, other stuff. And, and it's really just a mood that they create with the blast. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, you know, there, there are, um, I'd say probably the same 30 or 40 artists that I check out every now and then. And it's really kind of a way to just fill in the noise in the background. I'm, I'm not as much an active music listener as a Maybe. passive listener. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just the mood that I keep behind me. Oh, let me ask you one more question. It's going to be a heavy metal question. Okay. Uh, I always notice whenever people talk about heavy metal, they always ask these questions like, well, what do you think of the metal scene now? Versus <laughs> the metal scene then? But instead of asking you that, I'm going to ask you what your top five metal bands, it doesn't even have to be like a record, but if, if, if you want to make it a specific record, what would the five recordings by heavy metal band um, what, what five of those have influenced you the most on your journey? Okay. Music and drumming. Right, right. That is a very good question. So right off the bat, I can tell you the first two Trouble records. Yes. Right off the bat. The, the best two Trouble records. And I guess they really only had about a half a record that was really good after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was when, that, that's when I realized the mid to slow pace, heavy thing, how effective that could be and how much I loved it. Because man, those two guitarists are—they yeah. were phenomenal. Just uh, melody and emotion just dripped off their guitars. Uh, the drummer—I mean, it's a very, very <laughs> rock drummer, but he's a huge drummer, and he—he—he's absolutely part of why those records were as heavy as they were. Yes. Um, so th most of this stuff. Okay, so I might end up having to lump that in as one. So okay. in, in the formative years, there were trouble. Um, King Diamond, not Merciful Fate. I was never a Merciful Fate fan. So I was very surprised what's, when I liked King Diamond. What's the distinction? What's the distinction? I want to hear your version of the distinction. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with just the overall mix. Because some of those riffs really aren't that bad. And like the first King Diamond record kind of sounds like an extension of Merciful Fate anyway. Um, <clears throat> but they just, they, they just weren't heavy. Once I discovered trouble, it had to be heavy. If if it's not heavy, you're wasting your time. If it's not heavy, then it's just, it you know, it's just rock. <laughs> so, um, but King Diamond, um, particularly with um, God, I'm drawing a blank on his name. The drum, oh Mickey D. The, the Mickey D is like the the uh -oh. penultimate mid tempo metal drummer to me. I mean, he's he's just everything he does is perfect. He's not the most amazing drummer, but he's one of those guys you can tell, kind of like that guy Scott rock and field or whatever his name is from Queensryche, you know he can do more, but he decides he restrains himself so that he doesn't, you know, so that he's not just soloing over everything else. He's a very tasteful drummer. And Mickey yes. D is that as well. Um, so yeah, Trouble, King Diamond, um, a band I mentioned earlier called Nasty Savage who are from Florida. Um, they're just a really, really weird band. They do some really stupid things, some really stupid things, but they also do some of the weirdest, most unique things that you'll ever hear in, in metal. Um, and let's see, Destruction at the time were a big influence when, I, I kind of liked the first couple records anyway, but when Released From Agony came out, they had a different drummer and they were a completely different band. They were suddenly a lot more focused, a lot meaner riffing all of a sudden, um, and lots of detail. That was what that was the first album that I heard that had a transition that I had no idea what had just happened. That was the first time I had to go, wait, 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 play that again. I don't even I was listening and I have no idea what they just did. 
metal is good with that with those like like what the fuck just happened i gotta rewind that and hear what was that yeah <laughs> yeah well that that record released from agony man that, there's some of the there's some fantastic riffing on that um and then so that's okay so trouble king diamond nasty savage uh destruction and i'm going to say well i love god flesh it's not necessarily a musical influence we i like using those god flesh chords whenever possible the the um the um uh atonal stuff the um chords that don't technically work i love yeah. that but um I will jump ahead. Oh, okay. I guess I have to throw I have to throw Watchtower in there, and it's not that I could never play. But I could never play drums in Watchtower. All those guys are, you know, what they burp is better than anything I would ever be able to do. Uh, but it did inspire me to keep pushing myself. Confessor, we're never going to sound like them. I'll never be in a band that sounds like them. But they reminded me that there's so much more that I could be doing. So as far as um, driving me to do what I could, uh, Watchtower, and then later on Spastic Inc., which was uh, the same guitarist, but his his amazing brother drummer. Um, I'd, I'd have to put that in there at the time because they, they just completely blew me away. Absolutely blew me away. I don't love everything that they do. They're, you know, they're very self-indulgent, but that's their whole shtick. You know, they can do that. Nobody else can do it you know, try to emulate it if you can. And I'm sure there are probably a thousand videos on YouTube of 12 year olds blowing that the doors off that stuff. Right. <laughs> right, right, sure. Well, those are five very interesting uh, choices. Well, thank you. thank you. Well, gosh, back then, you know, metal was, uh, before people figured out the formula to it, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on. I think so. You know, like I said earlier, it was very, I found it as exciting as the punk rock world. Um, I just thought both of them had a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things in common, you know, and uh, it was motivated mainly by people that just really enjoyed what they were doing. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I, th I think the I think Rain and Blood is underground metals back in black. Yeah, I would say so, and that's probably arguably the premier. For, even even though it's so long ago, that's as a statement. That's not even my favorite Slayer record, but that as a statement, that's their most statement recording. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that um, that, well, so Metallica had, they were no longer underground at that point. And I think that's the point at which Slayer grabbed the reins and said, all right, fine, you make your millions and we're gonna be kings of the underground world. And they put that record out and they were kings. But I think Ride the Lightning is probably their most metal record. And it's, it's the only one that I would, that I would own at this point. Um, I like about half of the first record and I like a couple songs from Ride the Lightning and I guess half of uh, Master of Puppets and then mm -hmm. that's probably really it. And then like, um, I, I remember I bought Injustice for All and I was appalled by how it sounded. Yes. And then when the Black <laughs> Album came out and th this is absolutely nothing against any of those people at all. They were some cool people. But I remember when that record came out I, I bought it and I took it back the same day I bought it. I thought it was just horrible. Just so right. it reminded me of when Judas Priest did British Steel, and I was um, I, I actually would got into Judas Priest because of the record before that, Unleash in the East, mm -hmm. which is my favorite Judas Priest record. It has that guy Les Binks on drums. Right. So when British Steel came out, I was like, oh. When I turned the co cover and I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And then it was just like. You know, I love ACDC, but I, I, I don't want to hear Judas Priest playing ACDC. <laughs> it just, it reminded me of something like that, but not as good. Uh -huh. You know, I had given up on them actually before that. I, I'm, I'm like you, I, I liked I liked more than half of Master of Puppets, but there were a couple songs that were too long. Um, and then, yeah, when Injustice for All came out, you know, the first song, Blacken was pretty good, but I was waiting for the rest of the mix to kick in and I just, I couldn't do it. Here's the bass drum sound. Yeah, that that's the way I've imitated it for hey, years. Where's, well. <laughs> and, and then like, where's the bass? It's like, right. Poor Jason Newstead. It's like, Jesus Christ, man. You, 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 like, you got no bass on a record. How does that? Yeah. <laughs>